the other day someone asked me a colleague that a very sincere question and wanted to know Michael, you know, what has been the cost of you walking this path of fearlessness all your life and this teaching that you do that you're so committed to? And they were very impressed that I had been so committed and stuck on the path no matter what. And I said, yes, that's true. I have stuck on the path no matter what. Um, and it really is that the costs have been enormous. Uh, the costs are as big as the gains, so to speak. In other words, my production, my capability, the things I've created, the things that have failed, um, all of it, which, you know, leads to my own legacy of a path of fearlessness and this teaching about fear that I think is so important on the planet. But the real cost, I would definitely say, is in the end, it's the cost that most people do not agree with me. Um, in fact, disagree and if not hate the way that I approach life and the way I teach. And so the way I teach has started with my daughters. I have two daughters. They're now 40 and 42. It started with uh, the breakup of that marriage, probably because ultimately that first marriage, I was, you know, 30 years old when I got married. Uh, and, you know, it really turns out to be that I took too many risks and I took risks with the children as well. In growing up, uh, I was someone who thought a lot about child development and education, and I had looked at many critical alternatives to the norm and the mainstream of how to raise children. And uh, my wife at that time was not interested in those alternatives, obviously, as it turned out. Uh, I thought they were. I thought that person was going to be very flexible to, you know, doing it the alternatives way. And that was true at the talk level. But when it came down to the children and taking risks with the children, uh, didn't go over so well. And the kinds of risks I took were just things that I, I, I'm not somebody who, you know, carries a safety kit with me every moment and has my GPS and my phone and et cetera. Of course, those days they didn't have that. <laughs> but um, it really was that I trusted myself and I trusted them. I trusted the instinct of humans, actually. Um, at a very deep level. And that's probably because I had studied animal behavior for decades and decades before I ever became a parent. And I'm so glad I did because I, I really felt I knew something about animal behavior and about evolution, about life itself. And I really mean life in terms of like a cosmocentric view of life, not just an ethno or egocentric perspective on life, but a really truly cosmic perspective on life. And I was also aware that one of the costs of life is death. So this is like a deep ethic, right? That's at the basis of what I teach about fearlessness. Now, this is a very different teaching. Uh, I won't go into any examples of what I did with my children. They may not be pleased that I do it. No, it's okay. I, I'm a, I, I've ruffled their feathers many times, but I don't think that's actually the point of this video. It's really more to get to the point of I've met many spiritual teachers. I've met many, many life coaches um, in different ways, you know, and recently I heard a podcast um, on someone who's talking about fearless intelligence. And I have read books on people talking about fearless intelligence or you know, just be fearless, all kinds of things, right? Uh, as I do that, as I'm a critic, as I'm an educator, I want to look and see, is there some good stuff there that I can use in my work and, help other people and help the planet and help humanity find its way to a more sane and healthy, sustainable future. But uh, often I'm pretty critical. And so what I found of the late, and I'll just say in the last three or four decades, that there's a lot of movement in the new age and the wellness movement, the human potential to find this sort of elixir of the best way to be, which is to be young and healthy all the time, and then to find the right teachers, yoga, meditation, whoever, um, mind control, whatever the techniques are, spiritual gurus, and so on, that are going to teach you basically how to be profoundly relaxed, to be profoundly silent. And they have all these techniques and, and I've, I've heard their talks and I've read their, their various books and I've sat with some of them and listened to them. And of course, most of the time I keep my mouth shut, don't say much. I just listen and go, oh yeah, okay, I might ask a few questions. 
But what I find is they're very uncurious people. They are people that have found the right technology or methodology. And uh, there's a lot of attraction to this be profoundly silent, be profoundly relaxed, not just be relaxed, be silent. Uh, they always add profound in their advertising, their tagline. Anyway, I'm pretty skeptical about all that. It feels like a lot of advertising muck. But beyond that, uh, there's no doubt that they do something useful. So why I'm doing this video is, is I want to give a little different orientation. See what you think, because I would argue a spiritual development path, like the path of fearlessness. And you don't get, have to get hung up on spiritual if you don't like that term. I don't get hung up on it. Um, but if you want to relate to it that way, you can. Um, the basic gist of it is I am not that interested in people becoming profoundly relaxed or profoundly in a oneness state of mind. Calm, right? Peace, love, bliss. You can do that if you like. That's, I'm just saying that's fine and you can teach that. And I would, I would ask, and 50% of the time, that's my critique, and 50% of the time doing those practices I would like you to do primal awareness practices. Okay, primal awareness, what is that? Well, it started out when I, back in 1993, I started a school of sacred warriorship and I had studied various sacred warrior traditions, uh, mostly intellectually and reading, uh, admittedly. I didn't have per se one teacher, but I had many different teachers from the spiritual wellness communities, meditation communities and so on. People who are real risk takers uh, were the ones I was attracted to. And they were the ones that pushed us over the edge and see how you operate and act when you're over the edge, you know, over the edge of basically in terror. So primal awareness is primal terror. Okay, you could use primal fear if you want to be less extreme. But really primal terror is, I think, quite a satisfactory explanation of what happens when one loses their normal grip reference points in a kind of vertigo experience of the psychic social cultural norms and this is a way to the spiritual this is a way to activating a part of your being that's not just interested in primal silence primal relaxation if you will or just this what they call profound relaxation but it is a, an experience more to do with pushing to a place where you experience this really divine terror. Yeah. Now that is what I would call holistic spiritual development, integral development of all your being. Kind of gut level intelligent, gut mind, not just heart mind, not just super mind but gut and mind. Well, okay, you're not gonna to be too interested in this video if I don't give you an example of something I actually experienced and it's just one of many experiences, but one that fits a lot of theorizing by some of the people that I like the most who are into this kind of indigenous perspective of primal mind, primal awareness, and people who have really worked deeply like uh, Gavin De Becker in the security and risk field and the importance of risk for keeping your intelligence defense muscles, so to speak, at the most basic level at the gut. Uh, you could say intuition, but it's more than intuition. It is um, instinct, yes it is, it's cosmic instinct, and it's a mystery. <laughs> so let me get to the experience that I'm thinking of, uh, it came to me today after I woke up from my nap and I went, yeah, I, I want to talk about that experience. I, I've never shared it with anybody before. So here's the context. It's got to do with a kind of wilderness experience. And that's something that um, most of these people who are teaching some kind of spiritual development, um, most, most, especially the urban spiritual development coaches and teachers and gurus, um, 
they would be pretty much useless out in nature in the wilderness. Um, I don't want to sound too brash about all that when I say useless. I would just say it's not their fault. It's just they have not been, quote, trained and or excited about learning the spiritual path in nature that way in the wilderness. And of course, you know, as I know, there are many people, you know, Henry Thoreau, for example, and others who pioneered and have explored this idea of the initiate journey and the indigenous cultures and tribes often sending the warrior, you know, initiate off to the spiritual adventure of a vision quest. All that aside, I brought that into the School of Sacred Warrior in many different ways. And yes, I was the teacher, main instructor. And I also was very aware that most people are freaked out about killing anything. And they think that that's going to, you know, make them peaceful people because they don't have to kill anything. And yet they become extremely fear-based about getting around anything that's got to do with pred predation, um, prey predator relations, and this primary functional intelligence of defense that is built into all living organisms. I'm not going to give a lecture on that theory of defense intelligence and relationship to fear and fearlessness. So here's the experience that I would want my students in the School of Sacred Warriorship at that time, although it didn't continue as a program past uh, 1996. The basic experience I had was I was in my early 20s, so 24, somewhere in there. I had graduated in wildlife technology. I was an ecological technician, and I worked on a crew of wildlife study biologists, I was the technician and a fisheries person, and we worked in the wilderness in Alberta, um, off by Hinton, up in the mountains, uh, over 5,500 feet above sea level, lived in a little coal cabin um, all year round. And uh, we had stayed out there 10 days, came back for four for a holiday, but uh, I did this project on coal strip mining, and I was to do the wildlife study with the biologists of all kinds and other people, forestry people, and so on that were doing the study. We were environmentalists, we were hired by the coal company, and we had to produce the government report, right? It's called an environmental assessment. Well, this is my very first career in wildlife, and I was in love with wildlife ever since I was a little child, and this was my first career, which I loved, being a wildlife technician for, you know, a big company in, in Edmonton, and uh, you know, being able to travel in these four-wheel drive vehicles and walk and walk and walk the wilderness uh, up there in the mountains, high up. You know, grizzly bear, black bear, moose, cougar, wolves, all of them are up there. We saw the tracks more than we saw them, um, but the tracks were up there, and that was our job is to count and do some tracking of where their ranges were. And this was before, you know, um, they were going to build a new strip mine. They had already had an old strip mine, and we were also just seeing how they were reacting to those strip mines that were already in existence and possibly what might be some cautionaries that we could advise this coal company not to do um, to not damage so much of the environment, um, all the way from the streams of the headwaters of the beautiful creeks up there and the rainbow and cutthroat trout to the, you know, obviously, the bighorn sheep, mountain goats, deer, moose, etc. And how the whole thing turned out that I was so used to walking in the wilderness alone, without a gun, without a knife, without a compass. And you got to think that we are a long ways away from people up there. And <clears throat> when we dropped off, sometimes the other guys would take off. Um, there'd only be one or two of us out there. And I often went off on my own to do tracking. And one day I had to go out and check the traps. So we also had to do a little bit of trapping, lucky not too much, of trapping of small mammals. So it would be shrews, uh, voles, and mice, wild, that lived up in the 
quite high range of the mountains and the grassland slopes. And that was just one of the places that we went quite often. I had hiked up and camped on that slope. Um, and it was, it was about three or four miles away from base camp at the cabin. So when you get up there, you're far away. And again, no phones, no communication systems. Uh, these were just the days of what I, I loved of, you know, we just didn't worry about all those things. We, we had this deep trust. Some people would say stupidity and naivety. And yeah, they're probably a little of that. Um, but for the most part, that's how I, I was raised. And that's how I began to be really interested in fear as well. And it happened one day where I really learned a big fear lesson. So that's what this story is about. It's really the focus of what I wanted to teach today, what I realized really for the first time, how fear was such a good teacher. And it comes from my primal gut, this teaching, gut mind, like sometimes I like to call it the primal mind of this ancient instinct to survive. And not just survive, but be intelligent. So I was that off that day, I'd been gone all day checking traps. It was starting to get late at night. And I always had to kind of time it because I never took tent. I never had any extra food uh, or extra water. Um, I had my notebook and I was a bag collecting the traps that recording notes if we had caught any voles or mice that day. So I'm way up on this cliff area and it's grassy slope. So it wasn't like a rocky slope, but it was a really steep grassy slope and trees kind of all around the base of it. And again, mountains in the background and it was just a gorgeous, beautiful place. I loved going there and it was so quiet, so beautiful. And I'm working away as night is coming in. All of a sudden I notice there's a lot of fog starting to come in. I still had a few traps to collect further up the hill. So I thought I better get at that pretty quick. So just went up further up this hill slope. And I'd been here, as I say, many times below. There was a, a really nice cut road at the base of this long slope. So I always knew where the cut line road was. And it was, you know, a mining surveying road, forestry road. And that would eventually guide me back. I knew how to get if I followed those roads, there was a couple of them connecting, would get me back to the cabin. So no signs, right? You had to just learn those paths. And I had them learned really well. But I'm up in there and the fog comes in. You know, in the back of my mind, working on that grassy hill, I always knew that there was grizzly bears in that area. We'd seen tracks. Um, we'd heard stories of grizzly bears roaming that area that was not new to us. And it was just part of the risk, uh, just like packs of wolves, cougars, and so on. It was just part of the risk of the job. And to me, that was it. Uh, I never wanted to take a weapon. I said, you know, if, if an animal does me in at that point, that's my life. You know, I took the risks. I'm in their territory. Um, they're not in mine. And I basically would go down if that's what was going to happen. Um, so not that I wanted to be killed. I was only... 25, 26 years old. Um, but that was the reality of my ethical view. And it's really a view that was based on not trying to avoid risk, but living at the edge of this risk, living to learn and to really be so alive when you're out there. And, you know, you're not relying on the security of a weapon to back you up, right? You're not relying on other people when you're out alone. It's just you rely on yourself and you rely on your connection to that environment and your relation to it and all the mapping that you've done of those references for orientation of how to get to where you need to get to, including getting back to the cabin, which was essential, especially it was quite a cool fall that year. And yeah, uh, I wasn't dressed for full cold to hang out in the winter time, near winter up in the top of those hills. So I looked at the last few traps, and by this time, when I'd gone way up the hill, I noticed the fog had come in underneath. Um, so that, that was typical, not totally typical, because sometimes the fog would come in more from the top with clouds, like low clouds, right? 
coming in and then they'd kind of hide your view and you had to be careful of that you don't get caught in the clouds too. But this was a really cold, moist set of clouds that we call fog came from the low valley and it rose and rose up and I was all of a sudden in it um, before I could get down. So I knew, oh boy, okay, I better get out of here. I can't hardly see. And at one level, hardly being able to see in the forest is not a good thing for a lot of reasons, um, especially for a lot of reasons, I had to find the right way back. And the second one, I wasn't too worried at this point because I knew I could find this road cut at the base of this hill. Well, how did I know? We could just go down, right? You're going to hit that road cut. That, I, that road cut skirted around. As far as I remember, it skirted around, you know, this large section of that grassy hill, that steep slope. And so I had it in my mind that I, I knew how to ne negotiate my way out of here. So I started on the down path and I'm going down, 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 down. This is a steep hill, so it's, it's hard on the ankles. You're really having to balance yourself, um, not fall, trip. You can really go for a tumble. Um, and I couldn't get to the road cut. Um, again, fog's coming in pretty heavy. I'm not seeing a lot of things around me, but I said, but you know, you know that road's there. It was in my mind. I don't need to panic. Just, but I was getting anxious for sure. Just getting anxious being in the wilder forest, including what animals you might encounter, um, where they might be able to be able to see you, you can't see them. It's kind of like at nighttime, same thing. They can see you, you can't see them. Uh, that's always a very anxious state uh, of being uh, because we're on such unequal grounds. Uh, I like to be able to see, you know, my prey or my predators or whatever who's in the forest with me, but at nighttime in real dark, you can't do that if you don't carry a big light. And uh, this time it was, you know, still sort of dusk, um, but it was this fog that was just obscuring my view. I've never been up in the slopes before like that, that kind of fog. So by that time, I'm checking my watch and I'm going, woo, it's getting late. I need to get out of here but couldn't find the road. So I says, well, go back up because if you just go wandering, you, you're gonna get lost, um, right? Like I couldn't trust and somehow I said, I must somehow have got off on an angle coming down and I'm missing that road, that cut road cut. So I doing this all in my mind, getting into my instincts, right? Of navigation, orientation. And this is really primal function of the human, of any organism, is to know where you are all the time, more or less, in orientation to environmental cues. This is directions, right? So really, really deeply built into us to be instinctual, to recognize directions. I would say pretty much all living organisms have some sense of direction and knowing where they are roughly in reference to the environment and their own body moving in that environment. That's just like every organism has to have that more or less. So I was getting mine tested, my instincts for, for orientation. And so went back up the hill kind of got back to where I roughly was. I didn't go quite as high up. I says, okay, well, you know, I've been here before. Yeah, this, this is fine. I know there's sort of trees a little bit on the left there. Um, I'm just going to go down again. It's got to be down there, right? And so I do it. And like a boat, couldn't find the road again. Went up the hill again. Don't get lost by just wandering around down there because you could really get lost, especially if I hit more flat ground and get into trees and and I have no clue where I am at that point. I got to find that road. That's my savior. And so went up the hill again. Okay, now I'm starting to panic. Yep, <laughs> getting overtired. I was exhausted. I needed food. I was getting cold. And just all the circumstances of not a good combination, right, um, for really thinking well. And that's exactly what was happening 
I was starting to even doubt that I'm thinking well. Like, why am I confused? Am I, yeah, sit down. Okay, calm yourself. So here's where, you know, the meditation people come in. Yes, calm mind. You know, meditate so that you can think well and be present. But that wasn't going to do it. I tried that a couple times. Sat down again, relaxed. Tried going down the hill again, still couldn't find the road cut. I went down so far, I can't be this far down. I've got to be off on a different angle. Something's thrown me because I don't have references, right? So it's easy to go off on an angle and you don't know you're off on an angle because you can't see any references on the sides for the angles. I was getting pretty screwed up in orientation. So at one point I'm up the hill, sitting there, wondering what the hell am I going to do? I'm screwed. And so if this place is where you get to the bottom, right? Now we're coming into the bottom. My human mind, my heart mind, my love for nature, all of that was disappearing and dissolving. And then I suddenly sit there and I hear a growl, deep growl quite close. I'm peering through that mist and I can't see. I could see there's a little bit of edge of forest along the grassy slope. <clears throat> and I know the grizzly bears like those grassy slopes. I'd never seen a grizzly bear up there, but I had seen tracks and sign, scat sign. Oh boy, now my body is going below. Right? It's going below, below, down, down, down. My mind isn't functioning very good. My heart, mind isn't of calmness is not functioning very good. So I'm losing strategies. I'm losing heart. I'm losing courage. And then I go to the lower mind without knowing it. And I heard that grizzly. Boom. Heard it again a little bit later. And then I start saying, I gotta go down. I can't stay here. I've got to go down and find that trail. So just go and somehow, somehow I found the road cut. Why on about the sixth time after the grizzly bear growl, which is what I was pretty sure that's what it was, it was so deep. I got to get to that cut road and I got to get the heck out of that territory fast. That's all I knew. I found the cut road. I don't know how, why strategically I would have done that. What was different? I don't know. And when I was walking back on the cut road, Fog still pretty heavy, but I could at least see my feet on the ground on the road so I could just follow the road and I knew where all those different roads joined. Uh, I knew enough of that physical ground because I'd walked it so many times. It was like a map to get back. And there were fresh grizzly tracks in front of me a couple times that had come this way up the hill. How fresh, I don't know, but my mind was going, oh my God, I'm in grizzly territory. Move fast and get out. Of course, you don't want to run. <laughs> and that can also set them off to charge you. But I wasn't hearing any sounds after I got down to the to the muddy road. So I think I just kind of got some of my intelligences back. Um, and I got back to the cabin safe. Today, when I woke up from my nap, this is like 40 years later, plus probably like 46 years later, I'm thinking, you know what I think I heard it was not a grizzly bear. I had grizzly bear on my mind. Yeah, you would, as it's just a smart wildlife wilderness traveler in that territory, which is, there's grizzly bear. They live there, they breed there. But generally they don't want an encounter with a human. That's just the basic principle. Like all wild animals, they 
avoid humans if they can, unless they feel threatened with the young. But what I heard was my stomach growl. And in the excited, hyper-stimulated survival mode of my defense intelligence up on that hill, when I heard that growl, it was just so exaggerated and seemed bigger than it was. And I couldn't tell whether it was coming from there or there or there. I, it was hard to tell which direction. And I realized that was my stomach growl. I was incredibly hungry at that point. And I was terrified at that point. And my stomach growled as it does to let you know it's not happy with things and your state. I'm so distressed. And so all those chemicals as well, adding to an upset stomach when you get terrified. That's what my little girls, um, when they would get scared of going to school or scared of something, I my tummy aches, I don't want to go to school. And I knew it was their fear. And sometimes, yeah, they were really terrified. And it's hard to communicate that directly. They didn't even know how to, as most children do not. Point being, as an educator, as someone who works therapeutically with people, children, and otherwise, it is really important to help humans get in touch with their gut mind. That was the gut mind telling me and giving me an opportunity to handle terror in a way that my heart mind and my upper mind could not handle. In that incredibly severe condition of disorientation in a fog, in the wilderness. But my gut mind got me out the growl and what went through me then, what hooked up, something hooked up when I heard the growl. It was different than just me being lost, right? Now it's, I have a massive predator, a killer potentially, right on my doorstep and I am like helpless to defend myself. I can't even know how to run away from it hardly because I couldn't see which directions to go basically other than go down the hill of the grassy slope. But the bear is going to do the same thing. So they're going to outrun me, no problem at all. I was like in a place of absolute, quote, helplessness, hopelessness of my capacity to free myself to escape. But in the surging of the gut mind going on, it actually became a protector and it added some primal intelligence from a place I don't even know how that works in my entire body. I just know it's part of my three minds as I'm talking today. And from that moment, why was I able to find the path when I couldn't find it before? That's the connection. That's the joining of the dots today for me after 46 years. And I went, it helped me, that gut mind, find that trail beyond all my other capabilities and senses to find it. So that's the gist of the talk today. Um, uh, I'm ending this with attempting to share with you my critique of spiritual education in the last 30, 40 years, as I've witnessed it in North America, at least, and around a lot of the Western world, is that there is not near enough emphasis on this gut mind, or what we'll just call the primal mind, primal awareness, many terms have been used, which is other words, it's our animal nature, not just our human nature, and not our cultural nature alone, or our spiritual nature. Those are all maybe important levels, but in and of themselves, if they are missing the foundation of this lower animal nature, and our ability to be both a predator and a very smart prey that also knows how to find its way. And I was watching, just as I end, 
a wonderful documentary film um, by a scholar who studies bones, um, paleontologist, particularly of all the connections between how fish move to become amphibians, amphibians to reptiles split off to birds, and the reptiles became eventually mammals, mammals being eventually humans. And deep analysis in this documentary and the point sort of showing is that we learned all those great instincts for survival when we were a really tiny small mammal about yay big like a vole or a mouse. Um, they have all the bone structures, they found lots of skeletons of these creatures, and they were our earliest line to eventually becoming apes, uh, to humans, hominids. And they were running around and evolving at the time, these little mammals, um, really important that they could find a way to run and to find their holes and navigate in and through their holes because they were being chased by reptiles, a lot of dinosaurs and snakes. Reptiles ruled the earth at the time that little mammal appeared. So a huge instinct for orienting and escaping the, the prey, predators, and also being able to prey upon food that they were searching for, which they do. So um, that in mind, and just uh, connecting uh, the research uh, that I appreciated way back in the 19th, early mid 80s, 70s, when I was in environmental school, um, studying environmental biology and sciences, um, there was this theory of the tripart or the triune mind. Paul McLean uh, was a researcher who, neurobiologist at that time. So we're talking, you know, mid 70s, very different neurobiology and neuroscience at that time. But it, he had said there's, you know, we have a reptilian brain at the base of our skull as humans. We have a mammal brain sort of in the midbrain part. And then we have this more human cognitive, um, you know, executive functional parts of our hemispheres and the cerebrum at the front. And this mammal mind and, and reptilian mind are our animal mind our mammal mind and they are our earliest parts of our instincts of what i would call the best of fearlessness at the animal or gut mind level. we need to do more of that in spiritual education that's my agenda and that's what the school of sacred worship was about is to introduce people to um, really deeply understanding predator prey relationships and our instinctual intelligence and ecologies of predator-prey relationships, and not so much always stuck in the cultural and spiritual teachings and that whole worldview, all good, but not on its own, and not divided away from this deep animal part of ourselves. Thanks very much today, and keep practicing fearlessness. Let's have a chat. Send your comments down below. Pass the video on to others if you think they're interested. All the best.